Bye. Um, I, as speaker's host, I have the very great pleasure of introducing our guest speaker today, Kerry Ackmans. I'm not going into depth because she has so much to say to you all that um, I think you're going to be really, just your eyes are opened about what Girl Guides does for girls and young women in this state. Um, but the thing I do want to say about Kerry is how passionate she is. The thing that always comes across to me is her passion for the girls and for our organisation and the impact that it has on the association. So I'd like to welcome today, uh, as your guest speaker, Kerry Ackmans. We will just get the PowerPoint running as usual. And straight to fingers crossed. Good afternoon, Rotarians and guests today. It's a pleasure to be here. I've spoken to many Rotarian groups. In fact, it was your organisation that launched me on a professional speaking career, which I still have today, because I'll never forget speaking. There was a lovely chap who, some older years, but still enjoyed coming to his Rotary lunch, and he had his head down on his plate. And before I finished, he popped his head up and said, well, that was worth listening to, Lassie. You, you were quite good. Well, I think I could be onto something here. So thank you. I, I do really appreciate how Rotary helped me with that. And I was a girl guide. So I have to say also, of course, that Girl Guides helped me significantly in my career because Girl Guides is all about empowering girls and young women. As you can see from this slide, we've been doing it for over 100 years. It was all over 100 years ago that the girls in England rattled the gates of Crystal Palace to make sure that uh, Baden Powell and said, we want our own organisation for girls. And indeed, they got that. So a very long history steeped within England and Australia and spread worldwide. We're in fact, and it may surprise you to know, that we are 10 million strong worldwide. Now that is a massive organisation. Why? Because we're growing rapidly in developing countries where Girl Guides is a safe place that girls are allowed to go to and there's not a lot of places that they can go to. So they've been instrumental in allowing girls to develop and to grow and to learn, which is what Girl Guides is all about. I want to also talk today about what's happening in the not-for-profit space within charities and organisations like yours and ours as Girl Guides. I've spoken to over 100 CEOs across Australia about the challenges that have been experienced since COVID. Prior to that, a lot of these challenges were there. However, COVID has exacerbated them and what organisations are doing to resolve that. Between us as organisations, if we don't address these, our great missions that we have in place will not be fulfilled. For ours, we won't be able to empower girls and young women and you won't be able to create tomorrow. So it's very important that we do figure into our future planning how we can take on board the massive changes that we've had. The great saying is that change is the most constant thing in our lives, so you better get over that. And the first sign of madness is doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. And often you'll see that because we are such habit-forming creatures, we pedal really hard doing more of the same, thinking that that will work because it's always worked in the past. But it won't work now because we've never had such a changed society. Now, we've got five generations, intergenerations working together across a spectrum that still borders what we would call analogue and digital. And whilst we have this, we are still human. We were talking on our table, I was talking to Zing about, and he brought up about human traits of, you know, your greed, laziness. What's that other one, Zing? Greed, fear and laziness. Now, if you have a look at our world today, isn't it amazing to think that just recently we've had Remembrance Day, a very important day, and yet whilst we're having that day, there are still at least five active wars, and one that's impacted on our world significantly. Because if it wasn't for the current Ukraine-Russian war, we would probably have come out of COVID very well as a country. You know, we all banded together, we did what we needed to do, and we would be in a different place, but we're not. And it's because of war, and war is about fear. Fear of what someone else has, fear of what I don't have. 
And what's wonderful about organisations like Rotary and Girl Guides is that at the very base of our values is to help others. And if you are suffering, the best way to help yourself is to help others. Is that not right? It is always to serve. And that's why it's so important that our organisations continue to flourish, albeit in maybe a shaped and different way going forward. Now, you'll also see from that PowerPoint slide is that Girl Guides is a diverse and inclusive organisation. We're very proud to share that we spend a lot of our time taking in girls who are from disadvantaged backgrounds or are not experiencing the best that life could offer them. In schools today, it's very challenging for the teachers as well as for the students. If I have a group of students and I went in and I said, hands up, who's being bullied? Every single hand in that classroom would probably go up. And then if I ask, now, who's bullied someone? I don't know, Mr. Nobody, not me. But somebody's got to be doing it. It's happening somewhere, isn't it? It's amazing, isn't it? And now, sometime on, if you go into a group in a classroom and you say, who's feeling anxious today? Nearly every hand. Speaking to a parent the other day, they have a seven-year-old girl. Seems to be very well adjusted, but according to her parents, she's very anxious. So if everyone is anxious and everyone is being bullied, then who are the ones who are going to stand up as our future leaders to help others? And that's why organisations like ours are so important, because we will fulfil a role that frankly if the government knows that if not-for-profits stood away from what they did and all said, okay, that's it, we can't do this anymore, the gap that would be left would be huge. The not-for-profit sector is enormous and its impact is something to be counted for. But I think the reason that it hasn't been counted for so highly is because we do the work that we do without asking for recognition, without asking for payment, without asking for anybody to say and give us awards, we may give our own. So it hasn't gone as noticed as what it has previously, which is what it should do. But every organisation that I speak to, and as a straw poll, I've spoken to about 100 over the last year, COVID has really changed the landscape for our organisations because volunteers and their lives have changed. Your life, no doubt, has changed. The way that we interact has changed. I mean, COVID turned us literally into little cupboard dwellers. We didn't go out of our houses. We were forced to completely communicate online. And what's that meant? It's meant that for people who use volunteer-based organisations as their social connection and network where they would go and feel valued, where they would go and do good, that was taken away. And when that happens and you then retreat back into yourself, it's very hard to bridge that gap anymore. And I'm a strong believer that we now need everyone to step up and to help people trans back into the world of engagement. Do you all know someone who used to come to things all the time and now they don't? When you call them up, it's just, oh, yeah, look, maybe, or I might, or just a no. They just don't go out and look at work from home. For those of you still engaged in active work, or maybe you have children or grandchildren who are, there are organisations desperate to fill these buildings that they pay a lot of money for, but they can't get people back to work. Speaking to a chap who was on the board of PayPal, huge organisation, and they've got beautiful buildings. They've done all these major events to get people back into the office. They come back, the second they can leave, they leave and go back home. So isn't that interesting? Is that because they don't want to socialise or because their whole attitude towards life and the preciousness of time has changed? Because when you go to work, you spend a lot of time with people you didn't choose to. Now you will choose to be here. I can see that you're all happy to be interacting on the tables. But when we go to work, where we spend a third of our life, we don't actually choose to be there. So a lot of people are opting to say we'd rather stay at home and if we can communicate through this, we will. But we all know the value and the power of connection. It's at least 65% of how we receive our communication. It's that visual, isn't it? We see someone visually and within 17 seconds, like today when I stood up here, it only took you 17 seconds to decide what you think about me. Who I am, what I am, whether you like what I've got to say. That's it. And the attention span of the average adult these days is that long which is about 11 seconds that it takes you to track across a mouse pad or to swipe through a mobile phone. And sadly, 
mobile phones are for a lot of young people their best friend. They're more entertaining than another human will ever be. They can switch you off if you're on a mobile phone. They can't switch you off if you're another human. So it's interesting, isn't it, is that whilst we want to engage, we are now competing with something that's about this big. Isn't that incredible? Did you ever think that that would be your competition? As if life wasn't hard enough. <laughs> now we compete with a little black box. So where does an organisation like Girl Guides fulfil that space? Before I jump into that, I want to talk a little bit more about these challenges for not-for-profits to set up what we do and what we're trying to do. Because just like you, our organisation, we're 100 years plus, you're heading up for your 100th year. And whilst we managed very well with all of that volunteer space, I've already touched on how the number of the volunteers' life is changing. Less volunteers, less time, more pressure. Now we have increasing cost of living. So even getting in a car to go and volunteer costs you money, which previously no one would even think about it. But now I think, oh, not so sure. All of these things cost money. The resources that we have are obviously they're not on and on and on that you're going to get them, they're very finite, but they're reducing. So even if you have land and properties, whilst the value went up, now it costs more to build them. We have a whole lot of halls, but they have asbestos. They're not compliant to today's contemporary standards. And if you think about what we brought in as legislation to protect ourselves as humans, which is making sure there's no asbestos, making sure that buildings are compliant. And if you look at a volunteer's life when they join, once it was, thank you, happy to have you, here's your apron or here's your shovel or here's whatever it is we need you to do. Now it is, could you please go over there for the volunteer induction session and in about two days' time, we'll let you near someone to do something. Not because you want to, but because you have to. It's what compliance says, it's what work health safety says. And then it's not only that, it's, oh, and by the way, you need to be completely appropriate when you speak, to the point that you're terrified, perhaps, to even say anything. I had uh, lunch with a group of businessmen all weekend, not long ago, and they all used to own their own businesses, some of them quite well-known South Australians, and I said, none of you would get a job or be able to run a business. And they said, we know, we're all inappropriate, we love it, but anyway... <laughs> Don't worry, they won't be managers of your children anytime soon. But they acknowledge themselves that through habit, that's just how they are and they don't want to change. So for a lot of people who volunteer, think, I'm volunteering, I'm not being paid, I'm doing this out of my heart, therefore don't you tell me what I can say, how I will dress, where I will act, whom I have to put up with, makes it challenging, doesn't it? Is anyone agreeing with me or is the thing she's speaking a load of rubbish? <laughs> yes. Oh, we're agreeing. Yeah, I'm just speaking the truth. And Lisa did say that I'm a bit like that. I'm one of those people, oh, don't ask her because she'll say how it is. Everyone else is saying, gee, I wish I had said that. I'm the dumb bunny who always comes up here and says it. Because someone has to. Really, we have to get to the point where sense prevails. My father was a teacher, very sensible man. He said, common sense is a very scarce commodity, but there should be more of it. It's true, isn't it? Where is the self-accountability to say, I'm making myself responsible, therefore, yes, I understand you told me all of that, but I will take my own responsibility. Why doesn't that work? What stands in the way of me saying, look, if I want to climb that building, I'm happy to climb that building. What stands in the way? Legislation, rules. Uh, is anybody a lawyer in the room? I'm about to be a touch rude. Uh, <laughs> I need to say, you know, you, trust, you always trust God, the doctor, and then your lawyer. Interesting. And I'll always say that when a real estate agent's lips are moving, is there, you know, you know they're lying? Well, when a lawyer's breathing, he's billing. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> well, there's an opportunity, there's a way. No, seriously, we obviously need them, and we do need legislation to protect us. There's no doubts about that. I'm just being tongue-in-cheek. But it makes it tricky, doesn't it? Because on this side, we want volunteers and we need them. But on this side, it's almost like we have this insurmountable wall to make it really difficult. Even the things that you're selling all need to be vetted. I mean, what if they've been made by somebody in a slavery situation, which we have to think about. So there's so much more complexity to being involved in not-for-profit and running it and doing what we do. Does that mean to say that there isn't hope? Of course, there's always hope at the end. 
These issues of increasing costs, what we've got now and the compliance and worried about risk and less volunteers, they are all issues, but the great thing about them is is that together we can surmount this. And what I'd like to see is more shared resources, more shared services, collaboration. So I'm so thrilled to be invited today because I know that organisations like ours can do great things together. And why you should partner with the Girl Guides and why I'd ask you to see where we can collaborate and share is all the wonderful things that we do. So what do we do? We take girls on camp. We had our state camp up in the Riverland and it got completely weathered out. We had this mini tornado. Tornado Was it as bad as that one we just had? Maybe, maybe not, but pretty close. It was, yeah, pretty bad. Now, I have a lovely Queen's Guide over here, Emma, and alongside, you've been to mother, yes, guides as well. I was a girl guide. My mother was a district commissioner. We have a long history of this, so you think sort of get over it. But what's wonderful is to see the camaraderie, and you can see the tents lined up there, and so many of them were washed away, but the girls all pitched in, rolled the tents up, bunked in with other girls. We had our risk plans in place, and look at the smiles on the faces. Why is it so important to have an outside organisation besides school and your traditional groups for girls to go? Because if I'm a sporting organisation and I'm, for example, playing any of them, I won't pick one, but if I'm playing that sport, what's the aim in a sport? To win. To win. So therefore, if you're not the best player, how popular will you be? Not. And that doesn't mean to say that we don't have girls who play sport. I played sport. But the idea of guides is, is we're like that third family, the informal education where you're accepted regardless. Because sometimes school, as I said in the beginning of my presentation, is a scary place. Sometimes school fam family isn't fun at home. There's things going on at home. But you can always come to Girl Guides and be accepted, grow, learn. And our philosophy is it's girl-led programming. It's not defined. Yes, you learn and you get badges, but it's how you want to do it. If you're doing an IT badge, do whatever you want to do to get there. It's allowing the girls to grow and develop and nurture. And out of that brings leadership because they bring their best skills to the fore. And camp's one of the best things, ways you can go and do that. And it's not like school camp because school always has purpose-driven outcomes. God is to go and have fun. And through fun, you will learn. We also do serve the community. We've been involved in the Anzac ceremony, the youth ceremony, every year except when we weren't able to do it during COVID and we're again we were there this year and it's something the girls really enjoy doing and in their own areas we're across the state across the nation across the world girls are involved in the Anzac Day ceremony they're involved with their local nursing homes by going to sing Christmas carols and spend time they'll go and collect rubbish they're always there to lend a hand and to help and if you ask a group of young people these days to stand up and go and help voluntarily you're not always going to get a lot to do that but the ones who are girl guides certainly will because they know that to help others helps them become a better person and that's really what it's all about. I mentioned we help disadvantaged girls. We actually run a Camp Amity where girls who um, have compromised conditions are buddied up with a girl guide and they help them on that camp. It's amazingly successful and it does a lot of good for both the person with the disability or condition and the girl guide helping them because again it means they're stepping through a journey and learning empathy a very important skill that we all need to have how can we work together rosemary and girl guides well our campsites need work so if you're good with um, paint or anything like that always love that help and in fact rosemary has been very generous in their help to us over the time we also need equipment sponsored as well because we want to be able to help girls do things that anyone else can do through ropes, activities, learning, through creating. We'd love to create a maze at our campsite at Douglas Scrub near McLaren Vale, which is great for mindfulness, which helps with mental health issues. Girl Guys is one of the cheapest exercises a parent will ever pay for, $185 a year. If you compare that to most other activities, that is nothing. A few cups of coffee for the year. So if Rosie was able to sponsor some of our disadvantaged girls who aren't able to go on camps or to join Girl Guides, we'd certainly welcome some assistance. But beyond that, I'm sure collaboration between our organisations can assist us both to survive now and well into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kerry. We have some time for questions. 
And while we're just getting some mics, I have been speaking with Paul Thomas about uh, collaborating between Rotary Clubs right across the state because often where there are clubs, there are also guide units. So whether we can partner up there and um, create a longer, wider um, standing partnership would be awesome. Okay, uh, questions. Florian always has a question. We love people who always have a question. Thank he always you. has a question. A university lecture, so I have poor silence, and so you, you get the standard phenomenon if you ask students a question, so you never get anyone actually asking a question. I don't want to start a particular kind of like discussion, which, uh, but so let's say the, 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 how does it say, like the definition or the, the role of gender in society is changing. Um, how does this affect the kind of, because in guides in Australia are kind of clearly like they're Boy Scouts and Girl Guides. So how do you see the future in that regard? It's like, is there going to, do you expect changes? Do you expect the kind of like, the, okay, fine, we'll just continue like we are for the next 20 years, it will not affect us? Or what do you think is the future in that kind of regard of how to be like separately Girl Guides rather than just basically be part of the, the larger Scout movement? Uh, thank you for the question. Understandable one too. Now we will remain a female or girls only organisation, however that doesn't mean to say that we are not diverse and inclusive because we are and we do in fact have a lot of people transitioning. We do have girls who are transitioning, we have boys who are transitioning, but we do have rules around that. They need to have lived for a girl, they need to be undergoing certain medical situations that needs to be assessed individually so there's a lot of strict rules around it but we are open to it because we have to be because we see it every day whatever's happening out there is happening in girl guides so but we've been well prepared for it for some time uh, some of the great years of my life were from 11 to 17 when i was a boy scout wonderful so i relate to what you're talking about uh, but how are the young girls today finding out about guides are you promoting in schools colleges uh, and places like that, that so they're aware of it because I'm sitting here rather guilty today I have a 16 year old granddaughter and I've never raised the topic with her of a girl guide Really and, interesting. And I'm feeling yes. a bit guilty about that. No, look, and thank you for that, Gil. But if you know anybody else or got any friends, please feel free to share. Not too late, never too late. Look, I understand that, and I think girl guides, again, that humble, that hide your light under a bushel, have not been good at that. But like everybody else, we're changing, and you will see more presence, and we do understand that, and through digital means, we'll be able to do that. But it is a matter of getting the word out there because people think, oh, girl guides, are they still around? So we are going to be actively promoting in the community. Scouts, uh, as their own organisation, also have girls in as well. Now they accepted girls in many, many years ago and females. So it's not, I suppose, a bit like Lions and Rotary. It's that same sort of thing. You're similar organisations, but you are different. But we would always advocate together for the benefit of the programs, but not necessarily advocate our organisations together. Great presentation. Can I just ask you, the girls, where do they go from Girl Guides? If they're used to doing volunteering, how do they get channelled into another volunteer organisation once they exceed their age limit? They can, of course, stay with Girl Guides. We are actually five to we've passed life as we <laughs> gone home as they call it we, and we do have them but it's actively promoted to be involved and many involved in that volunteering space we're members of SANT volunteer we encourage all of our volunteers to go out and get other experiences but many of them still come back they often go away and come back as guide leaders yeah thank you for a great thank you, thank you. Yes, well I knew that someone was going to ask that. So unfortunately through our national, we're a federated model and unfortunately through our national office the contract did not get renewed due to lowering numbers and quantities but we believe in South Australia that had there been the right PR campaign we could have saved them and we do have plans for how we may be either to bring them back or an alternative because yes they were a great biscuit. But I don't hear about uh, 
girl guides halls. Well, unfortunately, we weren't left as many. That's how it goes. You know, boys and girls schools, they are, it's actually a fact of life. 75% of all philanthropic donations go to boys and 25% to girls. So we have about that mix, amazingly, in girl guides. So we have just far less halls. We do have them, but they need a lot of work to bring them up to scratch, which I said about rolling up the sleeves and if you're good enough for paintbrush. Sorry, is en enrolling girl guides? It's on. It's on. Or Boy Scouts recognised as and promoted as good for children's mental, mental health? We certainly do, and we're trying to get back into the schools to do that as well. But if we speak to many of our girls about the benefits of it, they'll say it's that break away from family and school, that third other environment. So it definitely is. It's a matter of us getting the message out. We've just done social impact studies, though, that will help give demonstrable proof through numbers of where girls will see the shift when they started guides to when they finished. Thank you so much for coming and speaking today, Kerry. Pleasure. It's been a great pleasure and um, all of the members really appreciate you coming. With that, um, I would like to present you with a certificate oh, of thanks Thank from our organisation, also that uh, you being here today. Uh, all the money in the bowls goes towards our community organisation's um, support. And we also have a little rotary teddy here oh, for you as well, oh, which is oh, uh, made by some of the families of the Rotarians. Oh, that's wonderful. So thank you very um, much. I would like you all to uh, stand and thank Kerry now.